Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Go look at a brief couple of verses from chapter 3 and then some from chapter 4. As we think about this, this exhortation to grow in grace. Exhortation to grow in grace. Next Sunday night now, we will not meet, but we will come back that following Sunday the 9th, and we will look at 2 Thessalonians, all right? So stand with me if you would, and follow along as I read these verses that are, the, are sort of theme verses, summary verses. They capture something of the essence of the letter that Paul wrote. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 12 and 13. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And then in chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, <clears throat> more about the coming of the Lord. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You remember that passage began, I don't want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep, about those who have died. What's their, what's their place in the return of Jesus? And so he says, encourage one another with these words. What have we just read together, folks? We've read together the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and we want to... Uh, take this time now. Uh, we're going to watch the video. we we'll just remind you briefly, John 5, 39 and 40 is our, is our theme passage. You know it. It's Jesus, uh, really a mild rebuke to religious leaders. You search the scriptures. It's not a bad thing. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it's they that bear witness about me. In other words, if, and this is true of anybody. Anybody that reads the Bible, with discernment, reads the Bible with, with the enlightening of the Holy Spirit, will see Jesus Christ in it and come to love him. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. That was the condemnation on the religious leaders. It's the condemnation on anyone today who will live and breathe the air that God gives us and yet refuse to come to Jesus that they might have life. Thank you. Please be seated. We'll watch the video now. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is most likely the earliest letter that we have from Paul, and the backstory for it is found in the book of Acts. It's where Paul and his co-worker Silas went to the ancient Greek city of Thessalonica. And after just one month of telling people the good news about Jesus, a large number of Jewish and Greek people gave their allegiance to Jesus, and they formed the first church community there. But trouble was brewing. Paul's announcement of the risen Jesus as the true Lord of the world, it led to suspicion. So the Christians in Thessalonica were eventually accused of defying Caesar, the Roman emperor, when they said that there is another king, Jesus. And this led to a persecution that got so intense, Paul and Silas actually had to flee from the city. And this was painful for them because they loved the people there so much. And so this letter is Paul's attempt to reconnect with the Christians in Thessalonica after he got a report from Timothy that they were doing more than okay, they were flourishing despite this intense persecution. He designed the letter to have two main movements. First is a celebration of their faithfulness to Jesus, and then he challenges them to keep growing as followers of Jesus. And then these two movements are surrounded by three prayers. The letter opens with a thanksgiving prayer. The two movements are linked together by a transitional prayer. And then the whole thing is concluded with a final prayer. It's a beautiful design. Paul opens by giving thanks and celebrating the Thessalonians' faith, their love for others, and their hope in Jesus despite persecution. He goes on to retell the story of their conversion, how they used to be idolatrous polytheists, and they were living in a culture where all of life was permeated by institutions and practices that honored the Greek and Roman gods. And Paul talks about how they turned away from those idols to serve the living and true God, and that they're now waiting for the coming of God's Son from heaven. 
So in a city like Thessalonica, transferring your allegiance to the creator God of Israel and to King Jesus, this came at a cost. Isolation from your neighbors, hostility from your family. But for the Thessalonians, the overwhelming love of Jesus who died for them and the hope of his return, it made it all worth it. Paul then retells the story of his mission in Thessalonica and of the dear friendships he formed with the people. He uses really intimate metaphors here. They treated him like their child, and he became like their mother and like their father. He says, we were happy to share with you not only the good news from God, but our very selves, because we came to dearly love you. Paul reminds us here that the essence of Christian leadership is not about power and having influence. It's about healthy relationships and humble, loving service. He reminds them that he never asked for money. He simply came to love and serve them in the name of Jesus. And so Paul moves on to reflect on their common persecution. Just like Jesus was rejected and killed by his own people, so now Paul is persecuted by his fellow Jews, and the Thessalonians are facing hostility from their Greek neighbors. And Paul draws a strange comfort from knowing that together their sufferings are a way of participating in the story of Jesus' own life and death. Paul then shares about the anguish he experienced when he heard of the hardships the Thessalonians had after he and Silas fled. So he sent Timothy to support them and see how they were doing. And to his joy, Timothy discovered that they were going strong. They were faithful to Jesus. They were full of love for God and their neighbors. And they longed to see Paul as much as he longed to see them. And so Paul concludes with a prayer for endurance. And what's cool is that he introduces here the topics he's going to address in the letter's second half. He prays that God will grow their capacity to love, that he'll strengthen their commitment to holiness as they fix their hope on the return of King Jesus. So he opens the letter's second movement by challenging them to a life that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus. So this means, first of all, a serious commitment to holiness and sexual purity. In contrast to the promiscuous, sexually destructive culture around them, they are to follow Jesus' teaching about experiencing the beauty and the power of sex within the haven of a committed marriage covenant relationship. God takes sexual misbehavior seriously, Paul says. It dishonors and destroys people and their dignity. Following Jesus also means a commitment to loving and serving others. So Paul instructs them that Christians should be known in the city as reliable people who work really hard, not just to make money, but so that they can have resources to provide for themselves and to generously share with people who are in need. After this, Paul addresses a number of questions the Thessalonians had raised about the future hope of Jesus' return. So some Christians in the church had recently died, most likely killed as martyrs, and their friends and family are wondering about their fate when Jesus returns. And so Paul makes it clear that despite their grief and loss, not even death can separate Christians from the love of Jesus. When he returns as king, he will call both the living and the dead to himself. And Paul uses a really cool image here. He uses language that would normally describe how a city subject to the Roman Caesar would send out a delegation to welcome or meet his arrival. Paul then applies this imagery to the arrival of King Jesus. He too will be greeted by a delegation of his people who will go to meet the Lord in the air as they welcome and escort him back to this world where he'll establish his kingdom of justice and peace. Paul then wants the Thessalonians to see how this hope should motivate faithfulness to Jesus. So he pokes fun at the famous Roman propaganda that it's Caesar who brings peace and security. Of course, Rome's peace came through violence, through enslaving their enemies and military occupation. And Paul warns that Jesus will return as king one day and confront this kind of injustice. Followers of King Jesus should live in the present as if that future day is already here. Despite the nighttime of human evil around them, they should stay sober and awake as the light of God's kingdom dawns here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul closes all of these exhortations like he began with a hopeful prayer, that God would permeate their lives with his holiness, that he would set them apart to be completely devoted and blameless until the return of King Jesus. First Thessalonians reminds us that from the very beginning, following Jesus as king has produced a truly countercultural or holy way of life. And this will sometimes generate suspicion and conflict among our neighbors. But the response of Jesus' followers to such hostility should always be love. 
meeting opposition with grace and generosity. And this way of life, it's motivated by hope in the coming kingdom of Jesus that has already begun in his resurrection from the dead. And so holiness, love, and future hope, that's what 1 Thessalonians is all about. That's an excellent summary. Thessalonica, Thessalonica, tomato, tomato. You get some different, different pronunciations of these things based really upon where your training came from and who your mentor was. And so uh, we'll grant that uh, to him, though I think when you look at the diphthong, it's Thessalonica, but that's just me. Okay, we're going to look at a, a quick, just a brief summary, and then we'll look at the outline survey and then go into a more more detailed survey as we do from week to week. Um, the church at Thessalonica was in many ways a model church. This is a, if you ever hear someone say, well, I wish, I just wish I was part of a New Testament church. This would be more, First Thessalonians, I think, be more of what you want to be a part of, more of a model church. Um, the, he commended them for their exemplary faith, uh, their diligent service, their patient steadfastness, and their overflowing joy. But he also gives some cautions to them. Uh, one writer said this, I thought was instructive, abounding in the work of the Lord is only one step removed from abandoning the work of the Lord through complacency. You may have known that in your own journey. Uh, you can move from, from a zeal and a really wanting to abound to, to a weariness and a complacency that you, you move from abounding to abandoning. So Paul exhorts the Thessalonians to ex excel in their faith, to increase in their love for one another, and to give thanks always for all things. Uh, he encourages them basically to stay focused. Stay focused as they labor for the Lord, looking for uh, the return of the Lord. When you break this, this uh, letter down into an outline, uh, it's important to know that the place from which Paul wrote this letter was Corinth, and the different materials seem to point to that. The date was around 51 AD. Again, I would take uh, issue with this being the earliest letter of Paul's. I think the, when you went through Galatians and, Paul and, and Joshua taught you that, I think the Galatian correspondence was in the 40-something AD, 44, 47 AD, which would place it as the earliest, but it's just, again, it's, it's a matter of how you piece together the Pauline chronology of the New Testament. So it breaks down into two uh, major headings, uh, reflections on the Thessalonians in chapter 1 through chapter 3. There's Paul's uh, thinking about his personal experience with them and looking back upon that. In uh, the first place, he commends them uh, for their growth. I want to read uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 10, to, just to get see how this picks up. It's a very, uh, very heartwarming, the things he says to them. Listen to this. Chapter 1, verse 1, he signs his letter first, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith. I want you to notice the three things he keys in on in the light of what we're doing in 1 Corinthians 13. Your work of faith faith. And the way you read these, by the way, is, is your work prompted by faith. That's the genitive form here. Your labor prompted by love and your steadfastness prompted by hope. Faith, hope, and love right there. These are the three that, are, that stand out the most to the Apostle Paul in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you how do we know? How does Paul know that the, that the people in, in Thessalonica who came to faith in Christ could be identified as chosen? Here's how we know. Because our gospel came to you not in, only in word. It did come only in word to some. To some, some recoiled against this and were violent uh, toward, toward the apostles and, the, and their companions. Not, in, not only in word, but also in power. Our gospel didn't make you mad. Our gospel grieved you to the point 
that you were convicted of your sin and repented of your sin and trusted in Christ. So it came to you also in, in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we, we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators. That's one of those words, one of those, there's three word categories for discipleship. This is the word in the Greek, mimites. You hear in that mimic. You became imitators of us. You saw how we lived, how we engaged, and you, you tried to incorporate that into your own lives. You became mim imitators of us and of the Lord. That's the main thing, not just, they weren't, they weren't Paul worshipers like some of the folks in Corinth. And of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction. It cost them something. Remember, we've said this, when you get into these Roman colonies and you begin to confess that Jesus is king, the, the pagan Romans hear uh, sedition. You have, uh, you're, you're questioning the kingship, the authority of Caesar. So it came to you uh, in, in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Point there, difficulty and joy are not at opposite ends of the spectrum so that you can't have joy if you're facing difficulty. He brings the two together. So that, here's the result, that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. We can point to you and talk about how you went through hardship, what it cost you, and yet you, you pressed on. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And I want you to see that. That's a, you turn to God. When you come to faith in Christ, there, there are preachers that preach a legalism. You just got to quit your sinning. Quit your sinning. Stop that. No, you turn to God in faith. And when you do, guess what? You turn from idols. You turn from sin. That turning, that word for conversion, uh, makes those things inevitable. To God from idols to serve the living and true God. It's not just a turning, it's a, it's, a, it's a journey. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So he's in chapter one there, and he's already setting before them that they're living, they're living for God, looking for Jesus, all right? So, so that's the... Uh, that's that powerful picture when he commends them for their growth. Secondly, he talks about how, how he founded the church there in Thessalonica, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And then uh, how Timothy came and strengthened uh, the church uh, as, as well. And then the second part, uh, instructions to the Thessalonians, chapter 4 through chapter 5. This is, this is not personal reflection. This is a practical exhortation he gives to them as he looks forward, as they go forward and they look, look for Jesus. He gives them directions for their growth, not reflecting on it in the first part, but directions for that. Uh, the revelation concerning the dead in Christ, there was, a, there was a concern. They're early in their Christian pilgrimage. They've lost members, and I agree with the, with the video, probably through martyrdom. Paul, you taught us that we need to live for God and look for Jesus coming. What about these who've been killed? Will they miss the second coming of Jesus? And that's when Paul gives that, that passage. We'll see it a couple of times tonight. But that where he says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. But they've asked a question. They don't know. Their concern is that, that because these brothers and sisters have died, that they will miss the return of Jesus. And should they die, should they pay the price of martyrdom, that they too would miss it. And so he, he addresses that. And then he describes the day of the Lord in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And then he closes it with an exhortation to holy living. Um, it becomes necessary for Paul to separate from the Thessalonians uh, through conflict that happens there after the church is formed. And so he, as he leaves, he's increasingly concerned uh, 
what's going on there? What's going on? He was ushered out for his own safety, but what, what about those I left behind? What's going to come with them? Uh, and so Timothy brings this report, and, uh, and Paul writes this letter in response to what he's learned from Timothy. So as we said earlier, he commends them for remaining steadfast under affliction. He exhorts them to continue to walk in Christ, their, their Christian walk to grow more and more. That's why this is an exhortation to growing in grace. He consoles them concerning the ones that they've, they've known in the congregation who have died in Christ. And this, uh, the theme of the coming of the Lord, we'll show you at the end of the study tonight that all five chapters have something to say about the coming of Jesus. It's, it's, kind of, it's unique in Paul's, Paul's writing. Um, in, this, in his first section, the personal reflections on Thessalonians, he uses the customary Greek grace and peace greetings of his day. That even though he writes in Greek, grace and peace, charis and irene, the, the charis greeting of the Greeks is a, is a be well, be well. Uh, the Hebrew greeting, we step over into Hebrew now, shalom, the Greek word's irene, but, but the word shalom in the Hebrew, and it carried this force over into the Greek, is if we were to see one another, I might say to you, grace, charis, uh, which is be well, be loved. Uh, if I said uh, irene in the Greek for peace, I'm really saying everything's okay between us, right? Because you see, that's what the word peace means. This peace that we have, Jesus has made peace with God through the blood of his cross. And so if, if, I, if I greeted you in the Greek and I said, Irene, if you didn't respond to me, Irene, that implies, no, all is not well. All is not well. Different cultures have different ways of expressing the nature of relationships. I remember when Conrad and Bayway was here, and he, the first time he and I sat down and got a chance to visit years and years ago, he told me about some of the customs in Zambia. I'm going I'm to take a little rabbit trail here because this is, fascinates me. They place a lot of stock in family, even how they name one another and call one another. But he told me about part of the marriage ritual. In the marriage ritual, the, the young man who's the suitor who takes an interest in the young lady shows his formal interest in her by having a relative come. He will show up at the house of the young lady to ask to speak to the head of the household, and he will have two plates turned on one another. He will come in and say, I would like to speak to the man of the house. And he sets these plates before him. He says, there's a young lady here uh, that my relative so-and-so has an interest in. The plates have within them a sum of money. Uh, it's the bride price. And so it's his gesture to say, if, if y'all are willing to let this get serious, we want to show you how serious we are. Well, that's a tricky thing. So the, so the head of the house will look. He may open the plates and look at them. He may feel like, that's not enough money. You've, you've offended my family and my daughter. And he may just shake his head no. So then <laughs> he'll have to go back to the family and say, we need to come up with some more, uh, what was it in Zambia? Some more kwacha. So we need to get some more kwacha. And so he may come back and he may have a, an adequate sum at that point. Or he may have had it the first time. And the father says that and says, yes, I will talk to my daughter and see if she has an interest in this young man. Now, Conrad said in this modern day with all the cyber communication and stuff, they've already been talking to one another, but, but a long time ago that was not the case. And so the relationship will continue. Well, the day will come, uh, when, and, the, and that money is the family's. That's the, that's the dowry. That's the bride price. And the day will come when the two get married, all right? Well, then you've moved down weeks, months, uh, the family stays in touch with their daughter. How, how's it going? How's he treating you? And if she is, has become unhappy, if the husband is not taking good care of her, then the family will send the plates back to the family of the young man. They may or may not have the money in them, but they send the plates back. And it's their gesture of saying, we're not happy with the way your son is treating our daughter. And so it's a powerful, some powerful images there to demonstrate the state of relationship. You see, that's, that's all about peace. Is there peace between us? Well, these were greetings that they made here. 
Arene. And they would say, Arene. And that came back, then you know, you had reason to believe everything was okay between us. So Paul opens his letters with that desire, that they would be experiencing the grace of God, experiencing their being loved by God, experiencing the peace of God that Jesus Christ purchased with his blood on the cross. Uh, the idea of contentment. And so what we just read, he declares his, uh, his thanksgiving for them. It's, it's quite a, astounding what he says. We don't need, wherever we go, we don't need to tell, all we need to do is mention Thessalonica. And they say, oh yeah, we've heard, we've heard men's great things going on in Thessalonica. It's quite a reputation to have. And then of course his, uh, he talks about them transforming from their heathenism, turning from idolatry to serve the one true and living God. Uh, and that faith, hope, and love. As I, as I said to you in chapter 1, verse 3, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your work prompted by faith, your labor prompted by love, your steadfastness prompted by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he kind of does a review of his ministry. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother uh, taking care of her own children. So he says, my relationship with you was that was I had the affection for you that a mother has. Uh, I've told you before that in the Hebrew, the word for, for a womb, a woman's womb, uh, develops into the word for mercy, ruhama. Ruhama, the Lord's mercy. It's a nurturing love. And then he goes on to say that, uh, that uh, you know, as a father, how like a father for, with his children, we exhorted each of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In other words, I, I related to you like a parent would to a child, like a mother would to her child, like a father would to his child. Um, so, just said, Timothy comes back with, a, with an encouraging report. He writes this letter, overjoyed to hear. Then he gives these, uh, these instructions to them. Uh, he wants to encourage them to continue, not to, not to grow weary in well-doing, not, not, another thing, when they experience an ease from persecution. See, persecution does one or two things. It can push you into the ditch of, of discouragement where you just say, I just can't go on. It's just, it's too hot, too intense. Or having experienced that, when persecution lets up, the dangerous thing is for the, for the believer to let up. That happens sometimes in China. We read about that. And for all that they faced in persecution. That's why Samuel Lamb said to us when we were over there with him years ago, persecution, good for the church. It keeps us on our toes. It keeps us focused to know how to have done with lesser things. And so he, he kind of gives them those exhortations that they keep on. He reminds them of his teaching on sexual and social matters. He had taught them when he was there. When you go into a culture, uh, and I would say America is becoming this very much so with all, with all the informal idolatry, all the, the sexualized nature everywhere, that it's not a given, it's not a given that folks' uh, perspective, that over their mind is a, is a good, clear uh, restatement of the moral law of God. It's not there. And that was true in Thessalonica. It would not be just automatic for them to come to faith in Christ and reject the notion of, uh, of immorality. They had grown up, their, remember in Corinth, their worship centered around immorality. They wouldn't automatically make the, the, the connection that that has to go. False worship was what that was. And it's true, and I've told you this story before, it's true in, in Latin America. I had a friend of mine who was who taught as a professor of one of our seminaries down in Cali, Colombia, and he preached in chapel one day on the seventh commandment, you should not commit adultery. And the students just flocked to him afterwards. And the professors were offended by what he had said because some of these professors, these Christian professors, had mistresses in this, uh, in this culture. It was a, considered a part of a, a man's machismo, a part of his manhood, uh, to not just have a wife but to have a mistress. And, and so my friend Steve walked him through the Scripture and said, no, that's not God's design. It's not God's ideal. So he caught a lot of flack from his uh, colleagues, and it was very instructive to the students. It's... So Paul's recognizing it's not a given that because you've come to faith in Christ that, that suddenly you have a comprehensive understanding of what is sin and what to turn away from. So he's teaching them again about that. Uh, 
we had that in our country for the longest. We had that superimposed. I don't know what it was like for you growing up in school. We had, a, we had the Ten Commandments hanging on the wall of our classroom. Now, that's not a, it's, it's not a talisman. It's not anything magic about it hanging there. But we knew it. We read from the Scripture every morning. One of my teachers read the, read the Bible. We prayed every morning. The principal came over the loudspeaker and prayed. I mean, that's how I grew up in elementary school, junior high school. And that all was abandoned uh, by Supreme Court decisions. Um, so it's not that way anymore. I mean, how far have we gone today? We've gone so far today that in some schools, saying the Pledge of Allegiance is considered bigoted because it offends some students who, who don't have multi-generational upbringing here in this country. It's, it's absurd. It's nonsense. But that's where we are. And so we need to hear what Paul's saying. We need to, we need to be careful to be instructing and teaching and, uh, and leading in morality. Um, he taught them about Christ's return. And we want to, the, the word here is the, uh, at the, at the coming is the word parousia, the parousia. Some people pronounce it parousia, the parousia. And that's what shows up time and time again. Every time, uh, in the New Testament, this can be checked out by simply getting a concordance and that, that shows you how the words are transliterated. Every time this word is used, it refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so he takes that up. The question is, have we missed these folks that are dead? Are they going to miss the second coming? And so listen, listen to this. He assures them that all who die in Christ will be resurrected at the parousia. So he says in 1 Corinthians 4.13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that is, who have died, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. We recognize that. The Scripture nowhere says that Christians should not grieve when a loved one dies. Of course we grieve. Grief is a measure. There's just usually two things. It's a measure of the love we had in that relationship, the depth of it. Now I've observed, I've done, I've done 40 years of ministry, I've seen a lot of funerals, where some people grieve, and that grief is guilt. They grieve because they, they neglected to love. But most healthy grief is grief out of, it shows the depth of the relationship. If my, if my wife of 44 years were to die, God, God forbid, that she were to die this next week, and you were to see me and say, I heard Karen died, and I say, yeah, it's really a shame you would think something is horribly wrong here. That's what John Wesley said about his wife. They had a horrible relationship. Someone stopped him in a carriage and said, we heard that we got word that your wife died. What a pity. Something wrong. So grief is the outflow of love in a relationship. But we, so we do grieve. We don't grieve hopelessly though that's the thing that you grieve do not grieve as others do who have no hope we grieve with hope we grieve that for the Christian who departs before we do that we've not said a final goodbye we've said so long for now that they've passed from from this life to life eternal and that by God's grace we will join them one day um, he goes on for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again. This is where our hope is anchored, by the way. It's in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Because Jesus conquered sin and death and hell in the grave, those who have died will also see the conquering effect of that through Jesus. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive and who are left until the parousia, there it is, the parousia of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, the old King James, if you remember this, said will not prevent those who have fallen asleep. So the, the upgrading of the language, precede is the word there. But if you live back in the 17th century, prevent wasn't like we used it to stop something. It's, it's, from the, uh, it's from the Latin preveneo, will not go before, will not go before. And so will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who've died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven 
with a cry of command. And he, he describes these, very, these, these cataclysmic things. The cry of a command, this, this shout. With the voice of an archangel, the archangel, archangel shouting, He comes! Your king comes! With the sound of the trumpet of God. Another angelic action. And the dead in Christ will rise first. In other words, when this happens, when he invades the skies, when he, when he empties heaven with the angelic army, the host of heaven, and he returns, they will be brought to life first. Then we who are alive and who remain, in other words, we've, we've remained alive, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. I appreciated what the video pointed out. This language here, this Greek language, is taken from the, from the conquering, the military arena. When, when word reached a city that the general was returning, and he was returning a victor from the battle, uh, they would send a delegation out of the city to greet him, to welcome him. And the people would get all excited and they would, they would throw garlands on the, on the path and, and wave, wave palms and, and just celebrate. Because, you know, in those days, if your general doesn't return, if he's lost the battle, guess what that means for you? The enemy's coming for you. So they would celebrate that, and they would, they would receive him back into the city with this great celebration, this great reception for the champion, for the victor. That's the picture here that's given to us. And so they go out, and they come back in, and we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Use these words when people say, well, so-and-so died. Tell them what Paul said. Well, Paul said, though, that all who have died in Jesus will be made alive when he returns. And so this is a powerful picture of the parousia, of the coming of the Lord. You hear a term what rapture used, that kind of language is used. And it is, it is, the rapture is the word for the catching up. And, and really what I think you need to come to understand if you're going to piece together, we looked at this in Revelation, by the way, when we went through this, is that this, this catching up and this return are, are simultaneous, near simultaneous, the going out, the coming uh, for Jesus to come in and lay down that he is conqueror. And then you read Revelation 19, the rider on the white horse who comes with a name faithful and true. And he, he gets off and he tramples his enemies like so many grapes in a vat of wine. It's powerful imagery, conquering, victorious imagery. And so uh, he goes in to describe in chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, the day of the Lord. So we know it's coming. Remember, John says in Revelation, I was, I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. The Lord's day got its name from the church anticipating the day of the Lord and gathering on the first day of the week to, to commemorate his death, burial, and resurrection and to anticipate his return. And they would say things among one another. You think it'll be today? Could it be today? And they would say that with hope. And then if they were facing real pressure in life, they would look at one another and say, do you think it could be today? And so this word Maranatha was developed. It's the Aramaic Greek language. Come quickly, Lord. Come quickly, Lord. They, they lived in constant anticipation of the return of the Lord. It's going to get them in trouble somewhat in 2 Thessalonians. When some folks became, and you've heard about this, I know, people do this today, became so preoccupied with the return of the Lord that they stopped working. They stopped, they stopped doing other things. You, and then you read about some group of Christians who are following some guy who's convinced them that he knows the day Jesus is returning. So they sell everything they have. They buy some part of a mountain somewhere off in Mark, Arkansas. Arkansas must not have any peaks that are just for the public to view. All these, folk, these groups have been buying up these mountains for years out there. And they go and meet up there and they wait. And I'm sure it's exciting the first few days. They wait, they talk about what it's gonna be like. They're closer to heaven because they're in the mountains, they're gonna see him first. I mean, you, 
then it turns bad because they wait and they wait and it doesn't happen. And the day passes, great disillusionment comes. Well, the Thessalonians are going to get themselves into trouble in Second Thessalonians. They will not work, they will not eat, Paul is going to say. So he's, he encourages them with this. And this, this coming, uh, the day of the Lord, uh, to, to be sober, he says. In other words, to, to be alert. To watch as children of light, which means you don't have time to live in the darkness. If you watch as children of the light, who are destined for this ultimate salvation, not, not wrath that's going to befall all those who are the inhabitants of the earth, that term we looked at in, in Revelation. So he encourages them in these exhortations to deal with integrity toward one another, to grow spiritually. And then he closes with this, I want to read this, this desire for their sanctification. Listen to this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 28. Now may the God of peace himself, we looked at this on a Wednesday night, sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we ought to wait, watch. He who calls you is faithful. It's going to happen. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. In other words, as you're, as you're living in the Christian life, as you're growing in grace, as you're anticipating the return of Jesus, pray for us. We pray for you. Pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. In other words, show, show affection to the body of Christ there in Thessalonica. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. It's very interesting. He doesn't use this kind of language anywhere else. You promised me that the church will hear, will hear this. You will read this letter to the church. In fact, to all the brothers seems to say, when you read it, if there are brothers who are not there, you make, you make arrangements for them to hear it read. Then he closes, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's a great closing exhortation to a very encouraging letter to a model church at this point in their, in their journey. Well, what about the, the title of, uh, of Thessalonians? It's, you would be familiar with this by now. Uh, there's two letters we have in our New Testament that are attributed to Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. This is Thessal Thessalonica's uh, A, Alpha, the first, okay? The first to the Thessalonians is what it means. The author, um, it's really unchallenged. In other words, we're in one of these areas where, where there's not a serious challenge laid throughout church history until the 19th century, and just parenthetically, if you know anything about, about uh, biblical criticism, and that's not, that's not criticizing the Bible, like I think it's nonsense, no. Criticism is a scholarship where you look at the scripture and try to ascertain as much as you can about its, its date, its author. So it was unchallenged. In the 19th century, there was a whole lot of European liberal scholarship that began to be brought to bear. And so some suggested, just giving you this, I don't believe it, uh, that it's that the lack of doctrinal content made Paul's authorship suspect. Uh, but that's just that's not a fair criticism. He takes up the return of Jesus, the day of the Lord, like he doesn't anywhere else in here. Takes up sanctification, growing in grace. He talks about election in chapter one. There's a lot of doctrine. He doesn't spend time on justification so much uh, as he does. He doesn't spend time. Uh, on depravity, uh, on, on the nature of God. I mean, he says things about God, God's attributes, but it's, but it's just a different kind of letter to a different kind of situation, and that's what you have to take into account. Uh, apparently, in, in Thessalonica, there was not serious doctrinal error there, like there was in some of the other churches that he wrote, Galatians, letters to the, letter to the churches in Galatians, Corinthians, these kind of things. So Paul is clearly the author of this. About the date and setting, um, give you a little background to the city itself. Thessalonica was a prominent seaport and the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia. When you hear about going to Macedonia, there are different places, but this is the, this is the capital 
of Macedonia. Uh, the city itself was located on the on the on the the Via Ignacia. It's a uh, the, the Ignatian Road. It's the main road from Rome to the east. Uh, you could see Mount Olympus from this road. And of course, that's where many of the Greek gods were said to, to have lived in the Greek pantheon. Uh, someone named Cassander expanded and, and strengthened this site around 315 BC, renamed it after his wife, uh, who was the half sister of Alexander the Great. The Romans conquered Macedonia in 168 BC. That, that date should be familiar to you. We've, we see about several of these Roman colonies falling, uh, these Greek colonies falling in, in 168, organized it into a single province 22 years later with Thessalonica as the capital city. It became what's called a free city. You could, you could live there uh, as a Roman citizen and, and, and even though not, you would experience some freedoms that you didn't have in the rest of the Roman Empire under Augustus with its own authority to appoint a governing board of magistrates who were called polytarchs, a, a group of leaders is what that means. Because it was positioned so strategically as this major, Rome, major road uh, to Rome, uh, it had much commercial success. And we're told that it had a population of about 200,000 at one time, which was, which was really big for, that, uh, for the first century. Uh, today, it survives under the name of a city called Salonika, or show deference to our, to our Bible project people, Salonika. Right? There was a sizable Jewish population there. Uh, there was a monotheism practiced by Judaism, and Gentiles were attracted to that, when they, the ones who become disenchanted with the, with the emptiness and the hollowness of, of Greek paganism. And we're told that these, uh, these people responded to Paul's reasoning in the synagogue when he ministered there on his second missionary journey. The Jews, the Orthodox Jews, became jealous of Paul's success and organized a mob uh, to oppose the Christian missionaries. They didn't find Paul and Silas, who were staying at the home of someone named Jason. So they got Jason. They they dragged him before the Polytarchs. They accused him of harboring traitors to Rome. That would be their, their mark in trade, that these are seditionists. Very much like the communists today will take our missionaries and call them spies, U.S. spies. The Polytarchs extracted a pledge guaranteeing the departure of Paul and Silas, who left that night for Berea. This was their sudden departure. They were there, flourishing in the work of the ministry there, and yet... I, it seems to me for the, sake, for the safety of Jason that they agreed to leave. Well, the, these Thessalonian Jews went to, uh, went to Berea and stirred up problems there. So Paul departed for Athens. And he left orders for Silas and Timothy to join him there. This is all in Acts 17, 11 to 16, as you can find. Not, it's not clear how long he was in Thessalonica. He mentions three Sabbaths. Some think he was there for a month, perhaps more. And it was a short, it was a shortened stay from what you typically have from Paul because he was basically ordered out of town. And I don't think Paul would have backed away from being persecuted, but I think the, the prospect of someone else paying a great price physically for, for Paul, he was not willing to allow that. He received two separate offerings from Philippi, one while he was 100 miles away while he was in Thessalonica. So look at Philippians 4, 15 and 16. It says, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Parenthetically, this is part of my reasoning for not believing that Thessalonica was the first church plant. Why would he have said no church as if there were several? I think there were these churches in, in the province of Galatia that had already been formed. And he says, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Uh, most of the Thessalonian converts were Gentiles uh, 
who had come out of idolatry. We saw that earlier in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9. We read that to you, how you turned to God from idols. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 16, for you brothers became imitators of the, church, of the churches of God in Christ uh, that are in Judea. You suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last, speaking about something tragic that happened to the detractors, those who were trying to hinder the advance. He told them he worked night and day. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Then 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 to 9, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. And so after this, uh, Silas and Timothy met Paul in Athens, just 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. I'm trying to piece together a chronology for you here. Therefore, when we could, no, could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. Yeah, I said, I had to know. I had to know how things were going. That was the heart, the pastoral heart of, of Paul. So he sent Timothy to Thessalonica. Uh, Silas went to Macedonia, probably Philippi. And his assistants later rejoined him in Corinth, according to Acts 18.5. And Silas sometimes is called Silvanus, and so that's why you see that name at the beginning of this letter. What about the theme and purpose? We said to you earlier, he wrote this about 51 AD. Uh, in response to Timothy's good report that he brought from there. The theme and the purpose, the basic theme of this letter is the salvation and sanctification of the Thessalonians. He gives five basic purposes for which this letter was written. First, he wanted to express his thanksgiving for their faith and their love and their steadfastness in the face of persecution. Second, he defended himself against slanderous attacks that evidently originated from the Jewish opposition, these, these Jews in, in Thessalonica who followed him to Berea. He reminds the Thessalonians of his conduct and motives while among them uh, in answer to those who, who claimed that he was a charlatan and a mercenary. Third, these Thessalonians needed encouragement and exhortation to resist the temptations of moral impurity and slothful behavior because that was what their culture was like all around them. Fourth. He sought to dispel their ignorance about the relationship of the dead in Christ to his, to his parousia, to his return. And he comforted them uh, with that truth that we read from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And fifth, Paul instructed the Thessalonians concerning their spiritual leaders, conduct, and worship. Look at this with me in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22 giving these, these short, pithy exhortations in closing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and who admonish you, to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. See what's beginning to happen? Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good unto one another. <clears throat> Excuse me. Seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So these are these closing, just these bursts. It's like I'm finishing up, maybe, maybe, maybe running out of, of parchment, and I want to give you some things to, to hang your hat on here. What about the keys? 
to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Well, the key word is sanctification. We took our, our, our term, our title out of that, to exhortation to grow in grace. Key verses we already read to you, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, and 13. Uh, may the Lord make you increase and abound. That's moving forward. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, about the return of the Lord. The key chapter is chapter 4. This includes the, the central passage of this letter. And it references the coming of the Lord when the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those who remain are caught up together with them. Well, what this whole study is about. Where, how do we see Jesus? What do we learn of Jesus in 1 Thessalonians? Well, he is seen as the believer's hope of salvation. Both now, they can have hope now, and at his coming particularly, the blessed hope. When he returns, Paul says that he will be the deliverer. Now look at 1 Thessalonians 1.10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He has done that on the cross. He will finally do it uh, at the end when he comes. Now remember, if I die tomorrow, Jesus came for me, all right? He came for me. And that's he, so he returns for his people in two ways. One at their death, the other at the consummation of the age when he comes for all those who are alive and remain. Then 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, 4 to 11. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, the day of the Lord. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We're not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. There it is, faith, hope, and love again. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. He's changed his metaphor here. Whether we're awake, that is living, or whether we're asleep, whether we've died, that we will be his, living with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. In other words, I'm not saying you're not doing this, but keep on doing this because that's necessary. As the pressure comes, the church really has got to go into hyperdrive in terms of encouraging one another and, and, and building one another up, reminding people that one another what we know, what we may not be feeling. When he comes, there will be a reward. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, for what is our hope or our joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Paul says, my, my joy will be not only to see Jesus, but to see you with Jesus. That's what makes it worth it all. At his coming, now there will be a perfection. He will perfect. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming, the parousia there, of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. There will be a resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. We've already read that to you. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will, so on and so forth. They'll not, they'll not precede those who've fallen asleep. The dead in Christ will rise first. There will be a sanctifying effect for all who trust him. 523, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there, this is how you see Jesus, the great hope now and the ultimate blessed hope when he returns. Well, it, the contribution of Colossians to, to the Bible, it's... Um, you should know by now, I shouldn't be surprised, between chapters 4, verse 13, and chapter 5, verse 11, this is one of the most uh, helpful and illuminating passages on the return of Jesus Christ. And I told you earlier, we're going we're to close with this, there's a reference to this great event in all five chapters. Let's just look at them here. Chapter 1, verse 10, you've heard this several times tonight, to wait for his son from heaven. So there's this picture of him coming to You're living. Waiting is not passive. Waiting is active. Waiting is pursuing the Lord, growing in grace. But you're waiting for his son from heaven, the resurrected one. 
who delivers us from the wrath to come. Chapter 2, uh, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Chapter 3, uh, verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming. Remember, all these references to coming is the word parousia, his appearing. Then 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. I don't want to ignore this passage, but we've read it several times. So we'll drop down to verse 16. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the airs, and so will we always be with the Lord. The second coming. Then 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. <clears throat> I don't think we've read this passage yet, so I want to read this one to you tonight. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. It's interesting, isn't it? Concerning the way God moves history. You don't, and they may have, if this may be a reference, commentators are different on this, that he's saying, I taught you that. I don't need to write you anything about that. Or he may be saying, you don't, you don't need that like you may think you need that. Harkening back to when the disciples were gathered with him, will you at this time restore the kingdom? He said, it's not given to you to know that. That's kept in the Father's plan. But here's what you need to know. You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you're going to be my witnesses. That's what you need to know. So he may be speaking that way. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. If I tell you, folks, your house is going to be robbed tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m., then it's not a surprise to you, is it? And he's using this language here to say, you don't, there's nothing I can tell you about the chronology of the day of the Lord that will get you ready just before it happens. You get ready for it by living a life of holiness all the way through. That's how you prepare for the return of Christ. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Same thing. You, you may know gestation dates. You may, as a woman, begin to realize, well, I'm getting close. I'm feeling some things, but you can't give the, 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 the moment if you, if you deliver. You can't do it. When he comes, there's no turning back. You don't go, well, I think I've changed my mind. No, no, you're in this all the way, <laughs> all the way. They'll not escape. But you're not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. And this is, we read this a while ago, you're children of light. So in other words, live that way live that way. So there's that exhortation in every chapter. And again, 523. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul body be kept blameless at the coming. There's that word, parousi, at the coming of the Lord. There are allusions in 1 Thessalonians to other doctrinal matters. But Paul did not feel the need with this church, which tells you there was, it was a very doctrinally healthy church to develop these ideas. He didn't feel that need. However long he was there, he taught them well. And in this, there's a tone, there's a pastoral tone of, of tenderness and affection and concern. He puts, he lays it all out, really. That's what one fellow said. It's all out there on his sleeves. You're not, you're not wondering how Paul feels about the church at Thessalonica. And so that's an, that's an overview of our study of this book, of how we see in Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica, how we see Jesus in this, how he portrays him. Questions or comments before we wrap this up? Anybody? Anybody?